Okay, recording is starting. Evelyn, you don't have to remind me, so I got it this time. So, good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, so, I, I have the Blackboard shell um, for this, at least for this unit. And I think next unit, uh, totally updated. I'm, I'm ahead of the game now a little bit. But uh, let me share my screen here and, and just kind of give you a quick uh, an intro. And I have it in student mode. So here's the unit two folder. Um, your crosswords are gonna be here. This is where your quiz is gonna pop up when it's due. I think it's not another week or so. And then your exam. And then um, <clears throat> I have all the videos up and I have all of the, um, the handouts. So you both have the PowerPoint and the PDF. Uh, this unit has all the PPT, the PowerPoint files, so you can open up. I, the next unit, I started to re, uh, withhold some of them because they're large files, like 12, 15 um, megabytes big because there's so much image. If you feel that you want the detailed images, just shoot me an email and I can, I can post them up there. If you want them, uh, most likely they're beneficial, and so then all I'll do is I'll just upload them to the Blackboard shell. You guys saw my announcement that went out about the uh, imperfections in the Blackboard shell. So, so some of you have been pretty good at, like, asking i can't find this and what about this that's great keep that coming as i said this is the first time i'm adapting this course i taught it last semester as pta 111 and i'm porting the material over so just some organization aspect um i created uh, two new videos i um oh before we move on this video right here lecture 2.3 it's short i think it's like 12 slides and i'm, I'm we're going to talk about it today a little bit but um it replaced a video that i had previously about muscle contraction if you're still a little bit on the fence about like concentric eccentric trying to visualize that this video will be the best one to go back to kind of revisit that after you've gone through some of the other videos so if it's still after today still making a little clarity lecture 2.3 it, it was meant to be uh not a standalone lecture but more of a um a supplement like a fo highly focused thing just on that is it concentric eccentric so then once we get out of the muscles, uh, we get the two other systems here. We have the articular system, which is just the follow-up or the finishing of chapter one from um, last aspect. It, it really gets into the bones and the bone physiology. And this class is not an anatomy class. It's a functional anatomy class. So really what you need to know is like degrees of freedom. And the video that I had from KIN 230, I think I'm going to put back up there uh, more for a conceptual perspective as we go into the other aspects. So that's why I kind of withheld it now. But the video that I had from 230, um, it got really into looking at these regional interdependence or kinetic chains, uh, meaning that movement that you do at your wrist is not just isolated to wrist, but it involves finger motion and muscles that control the elbow. And then if the elbow is dependent upon the wrist, that means that shoulder stability, because there's muscles that cross the elbow, can influence down that chain. So it starts looking at the body from these domino effect that even with gait, when you're walking, which is the fundamental human movement, motion at your big toe is influenced all the way up through your leg, through your pelvis, onto the opposite side of the body, through the spine, and then into your pinky on your right side. So um, there is a connection that's there. And when we study anatomy, we want to compartmentalize and isolate things down in their smallest components. When you, as a clinician, whether you're a personal trainer, physical therapist, athletic trainer, whatever you're doing, or you're just trying to tweak and um, uh, optimize, hack your own movements, being really appreciating this chain of effect. Hey, my hips really bother me. And you look at the hip and you're seeing a physical therapist and it's, it's failed miserably. What else can go on? Well, why don't you look at like the left shoulder or down at the right foot, because there might be something going on there. So I'll post that video back up just more for concept, not necessarily uh, more big picture, <clears throat> but in terms of this articular video, how long is it? It's yeah, it's 20 minutes. Um, it's not too long. It's not too short, but it just gets more into like um, the degrees of freedom and the uh, the different types of joints. So just not much to, to memorize, just more conceptual. And then the neuromuscular system, I, I borrowed two videos from KIN 230 and I kind of um, isolated them down for what you need to watch. So these end up being like 12 minutes each. And then I added a new video here, the dermatomes and myotomes. Uh, and so that's it. And then these are normal videos that, that determine some muscle tension in its entirety. And this concept here, active and passive insufficiency, this is another concept behind the concentric eccentric that is going to pop up in the different units. What it's talking about is really it's active and passive insufficiency are fancy names for muscles that are too long that can't lengthen anymore. So that would be passive insufficient or muscles that are too short and they can't contract anymore. And that that part, the first part might make sense because we've all experienced tight muscles. 
The second thing that I said about the active insufficiency, unless you've gone through the muscle video yet and you kind of understand we're strongest in mid-range, weakest in shortened position, it's that when you contract, when the muscles slide, when they get shorter and shorter, they're actually weakest in a shortened position muscularly. So when you're looking at when, when are you the strongest, it's typically in mid-range. And in this video, we talk about I don't think I used the example of the bicep curl, but if you think about it, like if you think about your exercise that you do, like way down, if your arm locks out, you're stuck in this position. And if you, when you start to get tired, like you're not going to be able to, like once you unlock the elbow, like, like you're not going to, you're not going to get past that. And even when you're doing your exercise in fatigue, you can't get it up all the way. And so you end up just kind of cranking out in those, in that mid range. So that's actively insufficient. And these play off each other and it gets into, um, most of the time this is taught and it's just overlooked like, okay, that's too long, that's too short, but it sets the stage for us clinically. And for those that have taken KIN 231 um, fitness assessment and programming, we talked about flexibility. It starts to expand your perspective of why things don't move the way they're supposed to move. So when you look at like, oh, I can't touch my toes, the most of society goes automatically to its tight hamstrings. But when you have a passively insufficient agonist, you're going to have, or an antagonist, you're going to have an, at the same time an actively insufficient uh, agonist. So they're always paired. So you never have passive insufficiency by itself or active insufficient. You always have them paired together. And now it's your job as a clinician, either as a strength coach, or as a personal trainer, physical therapist to say, hey, I'm going to intervene either in the tight tissue or where most of the research is at, I'm going to intervene in the actively insufficient on the shortened tissue. So it gives you, it, it doubles your expansion of what you can actually do when you're trying to work that in. So now that combined with what I said earlier with, it might not be a hamstring problem. It might be a, a hip flexor problem. It might, be, it might be a hip flexor problem, might be a spine problem. So just, just in those two concepts alone, this regional interdependence, the domino effect, the kinetic chains, and looking at active and passive insufficiency uh, opens up your your tools as a practitioner to make really significant changes more than what other people are able to do. So it's, it's cool stuff. It's big picture practical application, and we're not going to be able to get into it as much uh, in this t topic. But as we get into the each body part, like when we get into trunk and spine, we're going to talk about pelvic positioning. And then the next unit after trunk and spine, we get into the lower extremity and we'll talk about how the trunk and spine affect. And then, so I, I build up the course as it moves on. If I try to dump all this on you at once, it's going to be overload. So in this particular video, just understand these concepts of active and passive insufficiency, terminology, tightness, weakness, and I'll, I'll have that video on the regional interdependence. Outside of that, um, most of this, uh, this unit is going to be on this muscle contraction, um, this concentric, eccentric, isometric. And even even my best students still have trouble with this. It's just a, it's a it's it's just a hard thing to conceptualize. I'm because of the resources I created this semester. I'm fingers crossed, hopeful, and also because of the exam performance you guys did. I think this is going to be a big breakthrough semester for everyone. So I think it's cool with the resources that we have. Um, any questions on organization of blackboard shell or how what we're looking at for the rest of unit two? Perfect. Okay. Um, where are my, what do I want to do here? Let me reduce that one. Okay, so this lecture, this uh, PowerPoint, this is the one I was telling you about, that muscle contraction and gravity. And, um, uh, you know, you go through it and it, it has these flow charts here, but what it has, uh, it has, uh, and I, I talk about this, like making sure you understand the difference between assistance and resistance. But at the at the end here, it has these uh, handouts, and this is the basically the flow the flow chart of what we're doing for when you do your movement analysis. Um, as we after this unit, we move on. We're going to add a f number five to this, and the number five is going to be the specific muscles or divisions of muscles that are working. So right now we're just trying to, you know, the first one, two, and three is what we did in last unit. We're adding number four in this unit, and then five is going to be add respective to the body parts. But you're basically looking at what joint is moving, if there's movement. And I, one thing I don't think I clarified last time is, is it active movement or passive movement? Active move, movement meaning 
are you, the body, that local joint, is it involved in producing that movement? And not like, hey, I'm taking my other hand and I'm pulling, like, if, let's say you're going to do a cross body stretch here. And I take my hand and I grab my elbow and I pull across. Yes, I am doing the work internally, but it's an external force because I'm grabbing from the, it's not the joints that are involved here. So this would be a passive movement. This would be an active movement, right? It's being done purely by the agonist, by the muscles that cross that joint. The other, in this example, uh, passive movement would be you uh, have your, you go up and touch your shoulders, and now you, you let your arm come down by your side. That's passive movement, right? You're not really engaged in, in doing that. So is it active or, or passive? And then uh, the plane of movement is still there, right? Sad, you guys got that done pretty good. But number three is what we're going to focus on, the, the contraction. And this is where this comes in, this uh, flow sheet thing here. Let me actually go to the presentation view so we can. So then you start asking the question, is there movement? Yes or no? Uh, if there isn't, then it's an isometric contraction. Or if it's not active, that means it's just relaxed. There's no movement at all. You're sleeping, right? Or you're just in a passive gravity dependent position. Um, the first question there, is it active? Yes. Then we know if it's active, the only way it can be active is there's some level of muscle involvement. Muscle tension is being generated. Now, whether that muscle tension is great enough to overcome gravity and accelerate, or it's just slightly less than gravity to let gravity to win, or it's equal to gravity. If it's equal to gravity, it's gonna be that isometric contraction. Is it, if it's overcoming gravity, that means it's greater than gravity. It means that it's accelerating, it's gonna be a concentric contraction. Then you ask the question, is it moving with gravity? This part right here, this happens very far and few between. That you're going with gravity in that same direction, and you're accelerating. This is only with explosive movements, like a medicine ball slam, or um, you know, that's the the best example because I think that's like the most uh, the most uh, appropriate workout, right? If usually if you're going with gravity, it's assumed that you're going slower than gravity because you're controlling. That's going to be the yellow light. That's an eccentric contraction. So if you can work through this flow sheet and you can start to kind of understand the joints, it's great. Now, I know it's a lot to understand, and in that one video, I talk about how there's really only seven joints of the body that we are responsible for in the body, right? You have the wrist, and you have the, you have the hand motions, but we're not really doing a lot of, you know, you're doing more fine dexterity type stuff, manual stuff. But you have the wrist, you have the elbow, you have the shoulder, so that's three, two sides, six, but it, once you learn the right side, then there's no different on the left side. You have the equivalent in the, in the foot, you have the ankle, you have the knee, and you have the hip, so three there. Then you have the spine. And if you understand how the cervical spine moves, then you understand how they all move the same, even though you have different regions. So you really only have seven things that you have to take, take account for in terms of the body. And sometimes it's easier, you know, ideally you go into classes and in like math and science, and they always tell you, derive the formula or figure it out on your own. Don't memorize. I, I think that's that's a, that's, a, that's easy to say for someone that's an expert in the field that's been doing it for, for decades. But for students coming through, sometimes memorization is okay, as long as you realize that you're memorizing it and you, you're always working towards that. So if you just memorize like seven joints, and what we're gonna talk about today, um, as you guys have, might have heard me talk about before, there's really only three basic movements that the human body can do. You're either pushing things away from you, you're pulling things towards you, so that covers all of the upper body. And then for the lower extremity, you're changing elevation. So you're either sitting down or you're standing up. And 90 to 95, I'll even go out and say 98% of all exercises are derived from those three things. And the only thing that really changes, particularly like with the upper body, is are you in a vertical movement or are you in a horizontal movement? And that's, that's true for pushing or pulling, right? Pushing or pulling. So a lat pull down versus an overhead press or a row versus a, a bench press. And then with the lower extremity, you're either a hip dominant or knee dominant exercise. So sometimes that can be derived as either a uh, hip dominant, knee dominant, or a squat versus a hinge. So really you only have six exercises and movements that you know. And if you just memorize the planes and the muscle groups that are involved in that, and you guys already do that. For those that are working out, you know what you're training a chest day for. You know what you're doing back day. You know what exercises are good for, for biceps. You know what exercises are for triceps. Don't forget what you already know. So it's it's hard sometimes when you're trying to put your this new vernacular and new movements and think about it, but always revert back. You know that when you do squats, you're not training your hip flexors. Who who thinks that, right? 
if you've been in the gym enough. You're training your butt, your glutes, your hamstrings, your quads. Never changes, right? When you do bench press, you're not training back. When you do rope pull downs, you're not training bicep. You know that inherently. So don't forget that when you're taking your exam or doing your analysis. Just, you know, feel your body, you know what you know, and, and or not know what you know, you know what you know. Use what you know in that. So what I was going to do today was um, in, in the Blackboard shell, let me go back to the Blackboard shell. If you scroll down here, you have this, um, this document. It's the very last document. It's called the Movements with Muscles Outline. When you click on that, it's basically, um, it's this document here. It's the, the pushing movements teased out from vertical and horizontal. It's the pulling movements, vertical and horizontal, and it's your sit, stand, or bend, or your quad dominant or hip dominant type activities. And so you have six exercises. You can see here the planes of motion. So not so much the planes of motion, but the horizontal pressing, the bench press push-ups, um, and the muscle groups that are there. You can see like horizontal adductors and flexors are similar. And the reason why this document's here is more important for, let me pull up this other one here is that what we're gonna do today is we're just gonna analyze these movements. And if you analyze the barbell overhead press, any horizontal overhead pressing or vertical overhead pressing is gonna have the same muscle group, concentric, eccentric, joint motion, plane of motion, so forth. It might change a little bit if you go close grip, wide grip, but the muscle participation is gonna be the same. And it's gonna make segment number four for whether it's concentric, eccentric. And if you just memorize those six things, and over those seven joints, it becomes a lot easier when you start analyzing. So I'm not, I'm not, pro, I'm not a proponent of memorizing, but I do think it's a part of that baby step. It's like training wheels. So you're not going to use training wheels all the time, but use it as a crutch to get through it as you start to become more familiar with it. Once you're familiar with it, then you don't memorize. You're like, oh yeah, okay, I can just analyze that. I know it's going down and going forward. The things we're going to do is based on this other document uh, that I've already shared with you guys, the muscle control formula, right? This is the technical step, six steps. I reduced this down more. This is from the textbook or from a textbook from another class, but uh, this has examples here that you can go through. So if you can, if you go through this document, it will help. It's a, it's a lot. It's very wordy. I think my flow sheets that I created are better, right? I'd rather look at this. Uh, and then what we're going to do is just apply this to the examples. Um, Remember, I said that the uh, acceleration aspect, the traffic light, like stop, deceleration, acceleration is easier. Uh, traditionally, though, um, you have the lengthening, shortening aspect. So always kind of use that as well, that you can have lengthening. You're not going to have eccentric contraction and not have lengthening, right? You're not going to have concentric contraction and not have shortening. These are tied. The only problem is, is that sometimes if it's not active contraction, it's passive contraction, you often will get lengthening and shortening and then students will misappropriately say, hey, that like when I, if I, if I, if I have my arm here and I do uh, elbow extension, my biceps lengthened. They had to, to allow that to occur, right? But this was, this was the antagonist. The agonist was here, the tricep. So I'm, I'm doing elbow extension here. Yes, these are lengthening. Students want to say that this is an eccentric contraction, but that would be wrong because a contraction can only be active. The only thing that's contracting here are the triceps, and they're doing that concentrically. So that's where I kind of steer students away, but you can use it as a validation aspect. If it's lengthening and active, it's eccentric. And then the other thing I point out in the video is that what goes up must come down. And I do apologize for the change in colors. This should be yellow, but a big yellow thing is bad on the eyes. That when you do a movement, this is what I was talking about before last week when we said, think about what's the concentric action or what you see we're going with concentrically and just think the opposite because it's going to eventually, when you go the down phase of the squat, yeah, you start here and you are doing an eccentric contraction. You get to the bottom phase of the squat. And then when you, when you push out of the hole, you are doing a concentric contraction. It's the exact same muscles. The muscle doesn't change, doesn't flip. You're doing hip extensors on the way down and you're doing hip extensors on the way up. It's just that they are lengthening, controlling gravity and then shortening, accelerating, overcoming gravity, right? You could also do an exercise like with the lat pull down where you, instead of starting here, you start here, you're pulling down. And even though you're going, your arms are going down with gravity, the weight stack's going up. So this is a concentric contraction of the latissimus dorsi and the, or the horizontal adductors, adductors. And then as you go up, you're going up. So just keep in mind that it doesn't flip. Again, this is me telling you to know, use what you know. When you do barbell curl, when you're going down, you know, let's say you get off the rack and you start here with the bar by your chin, 
as you go down, you know that you're, you're training biceps that entire exercise. doesn't matter what rep or what phase of the rep. Just when you're going down, the elbow flexors are lengthening and they're controlling gravity. And then as, you, as you're locked out, as you go up, you are shortening overcoming gravity. So see, it's not as hard as it, see, it's just that there's, there's new moving parts going along with it. Okay, so uh, before you guys logged in, I was uh, I was pulling I had these exercises pulled up, but I just did a quick uh, Google search because I wanted to pull up some stuff, and I just did vertical pressing, and I pulled up a bunch of images. And vertical pressing is basically anything overhead. Uh, horizontal pressing is anything going for, in, for, in front of you, right? So are you moving in the frontal or transverse? I'm sorry, the transverse plane versus the frontal plane, like pushing things out towards you, or pushing things overhead. And then I found this website. Uh, which is, it's, it's a little personal training studio down the, uh, down the uh, street for me. And I'm going to go over there and say hi to these guys because you don't usually, you, you don't, you typically don't see this type of vernacular in the field, but it's, it's, it's changing, right? And this is where I don't think people appreciate the fitness industry is it used to be like these, the bro science, right? Like these knuckleheads in the gym and um, it, it's become like, it's become quasi physical therapy, like this corrective exercise, functional movement. Um, what's happened is the market has increased immensely because back in the day, physical therapy would get like 36 visits for, to work with a patient. And now we get eight. So insurance gets people to like 75% and then expect people to do things on their own as the deductibles have gotten huge, huge. Like it used to go from $500 a year to like five or $6,000 a year to bill out for physical therapy services is usually about 200 to $300 per visit. Like that's insane. The out of pocket expense to the person would normally be like 20 or $30 copay. So it's a deal. Personal training is like 60 bucks, 70 bucks. If you get a really qualified person, like 125 bucks, it's still half the price of physical therapy. And I would say that there's some corrective exercise specialists out there that are much more effective at getting people better than physical. So there's a big market for it. So it's cool to see this. But anyways, I pull up this website and you can see like the six basic movements, like you can see bench press, push, their, defini their definition of the six best horizontal movements. But as we go through these, I what I want to do is we can just go through this and see that, yeah, the exercise is slightly different biomechanically. So there might be different planes of motion that are involved, but the muscle activity is exactly the same. The joint action is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if you're analyzing a bench press, a push up, a dumbbell incline press, dips, or I even I don't even know what the hell earthquake quick press is, but earthquake press, right? We'll find out. It's gonna be the I can guarantee without even knowing the exercise, it's gonna be horizontal adduction or shoulder flexion. And on the way down, it's gonna be eccentric when you're in that downward phase, and on the way up it's gonna be concentric. All day. It's not gonna change. You can't trick me with a different exercise that's gonna be anything different than horizontal. So see the value in maybe memorizing that or at least look at categorizing things in this way. I'm an experiment with you guys. I'm, I'm, this is the first time I'm actually forcing people to try to memorize something and, but do it in a more digestible aspect. I think you guys are gonna, I think you guys are gonna crush it. So anyways, I'll post this link to this, what, these websites, the uh, Seriously Strong Training. Not that I, I really like these guys, but I like that when I did like vertical pressing, same thing, it's all gonna be different variations of it's all going to be variations going back to this movements with muscles. And one of the things I teach in my, uh, my fitness, like in the exercise 214, like the personal training classes is don't memorize teaching exercises, memorize fundamental primary movements. So once you, once you, once you teach your client how to master these six things, or once you teach your patient how to master these six things, the world is like you can now, now you can go to any website, pick any crazy exercise, earthquake press, tornado press, and hurricane press. I'm just making these up as we go, right? And your client's going to know how to do them. You're, know, you're going to know how to analyze it, and you're going to know how to program it into your program so you're not doing redundancy in your tissue, in your overload, in your uh, programming. Simple, right? So it takes a really complex thing and reduces it down. Okay, so let's go through some of these examples, and we'll go through, and uh, I, I was going to have it set up as a, is like a, a Mentimeter where we kind of do it together and maybe we'll do that for review next week, but we'll just do this here and um, let me pull up my uh, screen marking tool. Hopefully it works this time. Perfect. Are you going to work for me today? Yes, you are. All right, cool. Okay, so if we analyze this movement, this is our starting position, and we're, ooh, that's too, way too big. 
Okay, so we're going from left to right. Uh, gravity is always down, right? Gravity is always down. So when we look at this here, if we want to see what joint action, we're going to analyze the joints that are moving. It looks like it's the elbow and the shoulder that are moving. So we want to look at from right to left, what joint action was happening here. So definitely we see elbow extension and we see, uh, we either see some level of shoulder flexion or horizontal abduction. And if you go to the, uh, it just depends on how wide the grip is. And I, I think we talked about this, so you can see, actually, we didn't talk about this. Let me just, let me talk about that real quick. So grip position for our upper body and even for our lower body, um, like your foot, your, your foot placement. So if you're going to go close or wide or with the grip position close or wide, it's going to change the plane of motion that you're operating in. So you can kind of see here, you can appreciate here that we're looking at shoulder motions here. And if you were to look at this exercise, you would say push up, push up, right? He's doing some kind of horizontal pressing. In this case, he's, his, his hands are closer together. So now his, his elbows are coming down and you can see that he's operating mostly in the sagittal plane. So he would be, if his arms were moving, he'd be moving in this plane here because his arms are closer to his side, right? As he, as he abducts his shoulders 90 degrees, it puts him into that transverse plane and it now moves it from shoulder flexion here if he's pushing away to horizontal adduction as he's moving forward, right? And all it was was he went wider with his grip. Same thing happens with pull downs, right? If I go wide grip pull down, that's gonna force me more into the frontal plane right, because my arms are going to be out my side. And if I come closer grip, it's going to force me more into the sagittal plane as I'm here. That made things maybe a little tricky in uh, unit one for step number two of our analysis, what plane of motion it's happening in. It, it makes it totally irrelevant for muscle aspect, because if I look at it like a close grip pull down and a wide grip pull down, even though the gym myths are there that the close grip is for thicker back and the wide grip is for that, that's all bullshit. Um, it trains shoulder extensors and horizontal ad abductors, which are the exact same muscles, rhomboids, latissimus dorsi, teres major, posterior deltoid, tricep, doesn't matter. We're going to learn all that when we get to the shoulder, but I'm just saying here, if you see like a close grip or wide grip, it does change the plane of motion and that's good for biomechanical and neurological wear, but in terms of muscle participation, as you'll see from this, the movements of muscles, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same muscles. So whether I do incline press, decline press, or flat press, or whether I do close grip, wide grip, it's all the same muscles. Whether I do a squat, uh, a deadlift, a step up, a lunge, all the same muscles. If I do a overhead press, Arnold press, earthquake press, hurricane, all the same muscles. So don't worry about the names of the exercises. Reduce it down to the, the primary six. This These things you see here, the pushing movements, pulling movements, and just realize that when I go vertical versus horizontal, it might vary a little bit, okay? All right, so the reason why I brought this up with the close grip, wide grip is that we go back to this exercise here. Um, if you went really wide grip, you would say that that's like some level of uh, maybe abduction, right? And if I go close grip, that's gonna be shoulder flexion. And it would tease out in reality, it would be somewhere in between, somewhere in that oblique plane, so it wouldn't even matter. But what we're really focused here is the muscle. So, um, oh, I deleted my stuff. Okay, gravity down. And elbow, elbow. Okay, so we see elbow extension and we see, let's say some level of shoulder flexion, all right? Um, what joint action, uh, what muscle action are we seeing from here from left to right? Well, if gravity is down and the movement is is up, that's going against resistance, right? If gravity had its will, it would go down. So I'm overcoming that. So this would be a concentric activity. And this would be a concentric activity of the elbow extensors and the shoulder flexors or abductors, which are the same muscles. Anterior deltoid, upper fibers of pack, long head bicep as a shoulder flexor. Um, if we reverse this and we went from right to left, now I'm going down with gravity. Oops. Now it's an eccentric um, exercise, eccentric phase. 
of the exact same muscles, elbow extensors and shoulder flexors. And now every derivative of this, like whether it's a dumbbell press, an Arnold press, any type of vertical pressing, let's see what our friends over at Seriously Strong um, Uh, this is vertical pressing, so overhead press, behind the neck press, dumbbell press, Arnold press, oh, a land, yeah, landmine press, you're pushing up. So again, these are all great exercises, right? You don't have to analyze each one of these. They're all going to be the same. It's vertical pressing. So that what, what this really is setting the stage for, too, is when you get into the, when you start working with people and you start designing programs, you start uh, to prescribing exercises to, to overload certain tissues, it allows you to stay away from redundancy. It allows you to reduce and be really efficient with your training time. Like you don't need to do like just people in the gym that are doing like, oh, yeah, shoulder day. I'm going to do all six of these exercises. No, you don't. You do one. You do it for three or four weeks and then you rotate. Right. So as the tissues, the connective tissue, the ligaments, the cartilage gets used to this and starts to get a little over overloaded. Bang, you switch it up and now, oh, it's a different experience. And now I'm loading the tissues a little different. and I'm getting give those other tissues a break. Well, I still load the muscles, which have the highest amount of blood supply, which has the highest amount of recuperation which is fantastic, right? We want to focus that. So you give the connective tissue a break while you still load the tissues. It's like, it's basic, right? It's like the best thing you can do for your client and people don't do it at all. Hold on a second. You guys gotta go to another room. I got family party music time out here. I'm sorry, guys. All right. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Uh... So again, this is the barbell overhead press wide grip. Here's the close grip, same analysis, right? Shoulder flexion, shoulder extension. On the way up, it's concentric shoulder flexors and elbow extensors. We move to horizontal press. Um, we're going to be doing horizontal adduction and elbow extension. On the way up, though this is on the way down. So we start. This is good. We'll start down. So gravity is down. We're going from left to right. Um, my movement initially is down. I already told you the the joints. It's going to be the shoulder horizontal shoulder horizontal adduction and elbow flexion. You're seeing what muscles are involved here. Well, I'm going down. I'm I'm eccentric, so I'm going to, it's going to go to the opposite because I'm seeing elbow flexion horizontal. Uh, I'm sorry, horizontal abduction, which means it's going to be the extensors and the adductors, the horizontal adductors that are doing the work. Uh, let me pull this other because this this is where it gets tricky. It's it's you, students usually don't have a problem when you're starting concentrically because when you're starting concentrically, it's it's what you see. Oh, I see hip flexion. Oh, it's hip flexors. Oh, I see elbow extensors. Oh, it's elbow extensors. The problem is usually when the exercise initiates with a eccentric phase. So that's going to be your squats uh, and your uh, like bench press typically. Yes. Those are probably the two biggest, which are the two biggest exercises that are done, right? Um, probably, probably more bench press is done than squats, unfortunately. But okay, so you initiate. It's the, the when you see it, the initial phase as the eccentric contraction, where you get tri tricked up is like with the with the squat, or in case the, in case the bench press, you're seeing elbow flexion and you're seeing horizontal abduction. But those muscles are never on in this exercise. They're not on in this phase, and they're definitely not on in this phase. It is always the horizontal adductors and the shoulder and the elbow extensors, which is the, would be the answer if you're starting here and moving in that position. Let's go to the squat real quick. So when you analyze a squat, what you see when you're looking at like this hip motion and this knee motion, when you analyze this movement, oops. You're going from left to right, you're seeing hip flexion and you're seeing knee flexion. But the knee flexors and hip flexors are not on at all ever in this exercise. It's the hip extensors working eccentrically from left to right, and it's the hip extensors working concentrically from left to right. It's the knee flexors or knee uh, flex, uh, knee extensors working eccentrically from left to right, and the knee extensors working concentrically. But you know that you don't do squats and say, oh, yeah, my psoas are getting a hell of a workout today. No. You know you're doing this in your butt and your hamstrings and your quads are going to be sore. Now, if we look at a deadlift, the deadlift, it, let's analyze the joint motions first. It's hip extension, knee extension, right? So it's the ex exact same muscles. As I said, you'll be hard-pressed to find a lower body exercise that's not some form of triple extension. 
right? It's ankle extension, knee extension, hip extension, thus working the, always working the hip extensors, knee extensors, ankle plantar flexors. If you want to memorize that right now and write that down, that all leg exercises, 99, I would say outside of like isolated joint, like hamstring curls or whatever, um, all lower body exercises that we can think of, squats, deadlifts, lunges, step-ups, jumps, uh, someone throw out another exercise that's that you do for legs that I missed. It's all some level of triple extension. It's always going to be the hip extensors, knee extensors, and ankle plantar flexors. Never is the answer include a hip flexor, um, a, a dedicated isolated knee flexor, or a dorsiflexor. In this example, it's, it makes sense because we're seeing from left to right here, gravity is down, we're moving up that we see, oh, hip extension, knee extension, perfect, because it's concentric. You're starting in the bottom position and coming up. Whereas the squat, you're starting in the, in the up position and moving down, right? You're standing at the high, the peak, and now you're moving down to the bottom, whereas here, and the one thing about the, you know, as a tangent, a side note, one thing about the deadlift versus squat, these are, this just shows, to, this goes to show that it doesn't even matter the muscles that are involved, that these are dr dramatically different exercises because not because of the joint action, not because of the muscle activity, but it's because of the, I'm sorry, muscle participation. It's because of muscle activity. There's virtually no eccentric phase in the deadlift, right? You're just coming out of the bottom position, coming up. You don't need to control that bottom position. In this exercise, you have to control that bottom position or you're blown out your back, right? You have to be very dedicated and very much under control in this transition. Whereas down here, you're just picking it up. When you get up here, you're just dropping the bar or controlled descent. Just a side note. Okay, so we skipped. Um, yeah, so like you can see here, this is like a, a relatively wide grip bench press. So this is going to force him more into the his transverse plane, right? And then if you take like a close grip bench press, this is going to force him more in the sagittal plane. And it's going to be similar to, it's going to be exactly the same to this, right? So in terms of planes of motion, and joint actions are different. This would, when you do close grip, it's gonna be more shoulder flexion. When you do more wide grip, it's gonna be horizontal adduction. But when you look at the muscles, it's gonna be anterior deltoid, pec major, triceps, same, whether you're close grip or wide grip. And then the phases are gonna be the same. When you initiate on the way down, it's gonna be eccentric. And on the way up, it's gonna be concentric. Eccentric, concentric. Eccentric, concentric, because the load was going with gravity on the way down, and against gravity on the way up. This is the point where it starts to get boring because it starts to sound the same and it's because it is the same, right? It's redundant. You're just kind of, what's changing now is the muscle groups, right? It's joint actions. Here's a uh, deadlift, right? Um, but different than the conventional deadlift. This is a conventional deadlift. This is a remaining or semi-stiff-legged deadlift. You're starting in the top position, so the weight's here, and the weight's moving down. Oh, gravity's down. So that's, in, that's initiating with an eccentric movement. I see hip movement, I see knee movement, but mostly not so much knee movement, but let's actually, let's delete that. This is a hip hinge, which is isolating just the hips. So I'm seeing hip, what hip motion am I seeing here? From left to right. That's hip flexion. So hip flexion, more hip flexion. And then as I go from right to left, hip extension, hip extension. This is going down with gravity. I have too many arrows here now. So this was going with gravity. So that's an eccentric contraction of the hip extensors. And on the way back, it's a concentric contraction of the hip extensors. Very rarely do the muscles flip, right? Particularly in the sagittal and frontal planes. So when you're standing up or laying down on a bench, very rare does it move. The only time that the um, that the muscles will be different is when you have no eccentric phase to the lift. And the only time that happens is during um, this type of situation, is where you your movement is parallel or perpendicular, I'm sorry, is parallel to the earth or it's perpendicular to the force. So if I were to stand here and do some trunk rotation, that would be concentric to my left, 
and then it would be concentric to my right, concentric to my left, concentric to my right. Because there's no gravity. Gravity is, it's not that there's no gravity, it's just gravity is not influencing this movement at all. But most of the exercises are going to be here where you're going to have some resistance or some assistance, right? You're either going with gravity or you're going against gravity. Let's look at some pulling activities. So here uh, you have a, a horizontal pull. This is wide grip. You have a horizontal pull. You have close grip. So sagittal plane dominant versus transverse plane dominant. So similar to the horizontal press, just the only difference is, is instead of the load being this way, the load is, is this way, right? It's the same movement. So instead of your horizontal abductors, in this case, the gravity. So here, the, the thing tricky with like cable and trying to pulling activities is that even though uh, the bar is moving towards him, um, and it's not so much in the horizontal, it's going to be more the vertical, but this is attached to a pulley, and it's attached to a weight stack here, so that as come on, as he pulls in this way, this moves up, right? You guys see that the pulley attachment. Gravity is down, so when he pulls into his body, is that a concentric or eccentric activity? It should be concentric because as he pulls in, it's going the resistance, the load, the weight stack is going against gravity. It's going up. Uh, here he's producing some level of either shoulder extension or, in this case, horizontal abduction. So it would either be his shoulder extensors, horizontal abductors. In my exams. I have um, the muscle groups, I have it slashed hash. So it's extensors slash horizontal abductors. So if this sounds confusing, don't worry. I, I don't have anything that, that specific on the, because the muscles are the same. To me, when I think shoulder flexion, I think shoulder flexion, horizontal adduction, it's the same. I think shoulder extension and horizontal abduction, it's the same. Because you're never truly, like you can even see here, he's not, if he, if he was purely in the front, in the transverse plane, his arms would be way up here. Uh, his Let's do this. Let's make it three-dimensional. Yeah. His elbow would have to be up here. If it'd be way up here at 90 degrees. He's not. And he's not, even this guy here, he's not, his arms aren't tucked to his side. They're out a little bit. So the first guy, his shoulder's here. His other guy is here. It's the same, right? Unless you, like, specifically do that which isn't congruent with the shoulder joint, which you should never do. Most people are right there, right at that nice like angle of scapation for that. So again, we we learn planes in these nice 90 degree aspect, but in reality, we're, we're cheating a little bit. We're somewhat in between, right? So uh, I'm sorry to go on a tangent there, but I thought it was helpful. Um, this would be the shoulder extensors or horizontal abductors working concentrically as the bar is coming towards the chest and eccentrically as it's moving away from the chest. And it doesn't matter if it's wide grip or close grip. The only thing that's different is the plane of motion. And then what leaves us left is the vertical movements. So here's a pull down. This is the one that can be tricky because you're pulling down Gravity is down, so you want to think that it's going with gravity, but it's not because as he pulls down, the weight stack, you can see the weight stack in this image there, and you can see the weight stack there. The weight stack actually went up, which went overcome gravity, so pulling down towards the chest, chest is going to be concentric, and then as he goes up, it's eccentric. As he pulls down, it's going to be the, again, same muscles as the horizontal. I shouldn't probably use blue on a blue shirt there, right? Same muscles as the horizontal. So it's going to be the shoulder extensors or the horizontal abductors. Any questions? I'll, uh, I'll post this slide here too, and then I'll... Um, I don't know if I need to post this, this website, but it, again, I think, I think it just made my point. Like, let's look at horizontal pulling. Uh, dumbbell rows, we just got done analyzing, um, if you look at this uh, video, all right, just do the exercise, don't tell me your story. So you can see that he went from his arms down in that position and he, he pulled up, right? So it's shoulder extension, horizontal abduction, concentric on the way up, eccentric on the way down. 
single arm row, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, let's not, let's just, let's just look at the image, right? He's going to pull back uh, a one arm dumbbell row, right? These are all different exercises, all training the same thing. A barbell bent over row, body rows, TRX rows. Now, whether the loads move, it's the same. It's all the same. Now, all of these are different exercises neurologically and biomechanically, so it's good to have variation. But in terms of tissue stimulus and tissue recruitment and muscle activity, it's all the same. And you are in the business of tissue recruitment, right, when we're looking at this musculoskeletal aspect. So you don't need to do all six of these exercises in one workout, but it's good to vary that and do this for two or three weeks and then that for two or three weeks. And, but that's, that's getting another class. But any questions? Does you guys, did you guys find this helpful today? It's, it's not, it's a lot, but it's, um, it's doable, right? It's doable. And don't worry about individual muscles right now. Just worry about muscle groups. And if you want to just reduce it down to those, to those six movements and just kind of combine those together, I think you're going to be in really good shape. And then as we get into like, when we get into trunk and spine, uh, just one area we'll start to incorporate with like trunk rotation and but as long as you can appreciate like uh, the the uh, well trunk and spine is a little different because you really only have three things you can do you can do flex and extend lateral lateral and rotate so you're not really looking at exercises but it, a lot of the core exercises are that the only thing my only concern with this unit too is that um, we focused all of our time online here with the the movement and the muscles, which I th which I've said is the big thing that's going to carry forward. But there are things in there about like muscle function a little bit and a little bit on terms of force production on the bones and the joints. So don't neglect those videos. Um, it's a lot of content. I understand that. Um, but you have you had last week. You have all of this week to kind of go through this, and then we also have all of next week. So we have three weeks to really. I, I'm pretty sure we have three weeks. Let me just make sure before we. Yeah, because we'll, well, our next exam will launch not next week, but the, or the quiz will be due. Yeah, no, we have, we have three weeks. Uh, let's see, we're on the, we're in week five into the 15. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, so we, the quiz two won't be due until the 23rd of this month. So we have two weeks, right? No, it's next week, and that means that the exam is due the 28th. So you have all this week and all of next week to to go through all this material. So the, the next exam is going to be due on the 28th of February. So we got got plenty of time. Hopefully, you guys were digging through those muscle videos last week, and you didn't put it off. If you did, you got some catch up to do. If you've been on top of that, you're in a really good spot. So that's it. I'll stick around if you guys have any questions. Uh, next week we'll kind of we'll do like kind of a review. Uh, we'll go look. We'll we'll kind of do we'll clean house a little bit. We'll look at some of the the points in the skeletal system. We'll look at some of the points in the um, the uh, the bones and the regional interdependence. And then what I will do is I'll do like a little mini quiz and I'll set it up in um in like a like exam question format. We'll do like the Mentimeter and we'll do that for next Tuesday and we'll just test you kind of like uh, just see where you're at and uh, go from there. Perfect, hopefully you guys had a good weekend. Uh, happy studying this week. If you find any errors on the Blackboard shell, let me know, I appreciate it and um, we'll see ya.